curious to see how many people join us. Where are you coming to us from, Wayne? I'm in the US in uh, New Jersey. So uh, if there's any explosions in the background while I'm talking, it's because it's the 4th of July. Oh yeah, happy Independence Day. Do you, is that a uh, thing you say? I don't remember. Do people say happy Independence Day? I I don't think I've ever said that to anybody. I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it just is Independence Day. Yes. Yeah, I guess, about, I guess sort of. How about you, Alex, or are you? Uh, I'm in the Netherlands. All right. Who else is here? Hi, Abhishek. How are you? Hey, Jeremy. I'm good. Where are I you joining us from? I'm joining from India. It's quite early in the morning. Yeah. yeah. India is a big place. Whereabouts in India are you? Uh, I'm in Lucknow, uh, near Delhi, northern uh -huh. India. And what's the time there? It's 5.30 a.m. Oh, Korea, are you in India too? Yeah, I'm in India too. Uh, I'm in South of India, actually, in Kerala. Oh, Kerala. Awesome. I, apparently, that's really beautiful. I used to work with somebody from Kerala who said I should come visit him one day, but I never managed to. Yeah, you should definitely go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'd love it. It's like the one country I've always wanted to visit, but yet, as but haven't yet. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> I think you should come to any conferences or something like that. Yeah. And so I want you to try aloo parathas in Delhi, Jeremy, because yeah. I know that's the Indian bread you like. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of Indian foods I like. We do get some pretty decent dosa near here, which is nice. We didn't used to, but now we do. But I'm sure it's nowhere near as good as the dosa that you get in India. I don't think I've ever had an Indian meal I didn't like. I see Wasim is here as well. Thanks for all your help recently, Wasim. Although he's muted and de-videoed. Maybe he's being coy. Hi, Tradesh, how are you? Also muted and de-videoed. That's fine. Hello, I'm just. Oh, here he comes. Uh, yeah, just just hanging around, but yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's July Fourth. So yeah, how's your July Fourth going so far? Um, nothing much right now, but we're going to have some food and stuff. So yeah, <laughs> we're preparing. So awesome. And I guess we'll see. We'll see what there's any fireworks on TV All or right. something like that. Yeah, and we've got some Aussies here as well. Hi, Radek. Hi, Sarada. Hello, hello. How are you doing, Eric? Good, good. So excited for the session. All right. Well, let's get started, shall we? Is is anybody here had any experience with APO or J or K? Nobody I've played around with it. Yeah. Uh, hi, Felix. Yeah, where where are same. you coming to us from? I'm in Washington D.C. And what's what have you what have you done with it, Felix? Uh, mostly toy stuff. I was doing Advent of Code last year in in APL. Okay. So okay, so you're probably going to be able to teach us some some stuff. And who else? Somebody else said they might have done a little bit. I think. Uh, I've done a little bit less than well, less than less than Felix, but um, just just played around with it. Um, just started trying to go through it. A linear algebra course, chapter one in NAPL. Okay, awesome. That's a, like, is it a linear algebra in APL course, or you're just like doing a, a linear uh, algebra course and using APL? It's a, a textbook that is um, linear. It's a linear algebra textbook, and and they chose APL as the. As oh wow! The Can you share a link so, to it in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. You got any Independence Day things happening today, Isaac? Um, just this call. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be fireworks going on sometime, but I don't, yeah. I don't know that we're going to go watch them or anything. All right. Well, I'm glad there's some folks who hopefully can help uh, 
help us figure things out because I've got very I, I've got very little background in this other than teaching my kids some math using APL and a little bit of playing around with J. I was actually on the uh, Arraycast podcast this morning, so uh, lots of APL things happening in my life today. Applied linear algebra with APL. All right, I guess I should share my screen so that people can show what you're sharing. Share screen. Share. So this is one of the things I like about APL is that there is, you know, a bunch of books and whatever around that use APL to teach other things. Well, let us know how it goes. I've never heard of this one. Yeah, it looks good so far. Um, I'm, I just finished um, chapter, chapter one, section two, so I'm not even completely through chapter one, but mm -hmm. when I'm further along, I'll, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, hopefully everybody's done step one. If you haven't yet, that is to install Dialog APL. There is a bunch of different APL inter uh, interpreters around, but um, they're not all the same. Um, and Dialog seems to be the one that it's by far the most heavily invested in uh, and has a bunch of like cool things that aren't necessarily in the other APLs. Um, and I do recommend installing it from their website. Um, you don't have to register or anything. There is a um, uh, there is a you know option to download an unregistered version, and it works perfectly. Um, so I'm on Windows, um, but there's also a Mac one, and then there's both Debian and you know or, or Ubuntu and Red Hat RPM whatever options for Linux. I think the Linux one doesn't come with a GUI. Um, so I'm not installing this on um, Linux at the moment, so I haven't tried this. I'll try it later. But there is a GUI you can download called Ride. Now, that comes with the Mac one. And Windows comes with its own GUI. But there's also, if you go to the latest release here for Ride, you'll find there's uh, RPM and Deb for AMD and ARM platforms. So I think you have to install Dialog first, and then you install Ride. Um, OK, so then to run Dialog, yeah, you know, uh, on Mac, with. Uh, um, command space, type dialog, or on Windows, hit the Windows button and type dialog. Um, now, one thing I found a little hard to find, which is actually pretty obvious now, I know where it is, is I'm increasing the font size. You just do it in the toolbar up here, like so. Um, I can't remember if you have to reboot after you install dialog or not, because it does install a uh, a keyboard. Um, now, dialog keyboard. Yeah, APL fonts and keyboards. So if you scroll down to the bottom here, there's, it's a little hard to see actually, but there's actually different tabs here. Um, so on Windows, you should find that you can, um, so there's a language bar with all the different glyphs, right? But you can also hold down Control and press a keyboard button to get a glyph. So there's Control A, Control J, Control hyphen. On Mac, it's you press back tick, this button, and then press the letter. Um, so what I did is there's a few ways you can do this, um, on, on windows, I can't remember if Mac does this as well. If you wave your mouse over something in the, um, toolbar, it tells you what button to press to get it. Um, and then the other thing I did was I just Googled for 
APL keyboard. And I just printed out, oh, that doesn't work because of my background thing. Hang on. Uh, video and blur. I printed out just a picture of an APL keyboard, uh, which honestly I haven't referred to too much because the um, the one in the IDE works so right. So it looks like on macOS we have that uh, little tooltip thing showing up too. Oh, okay. And you know, I don't know like if it's any use or not, but if you want to in Windows, you can use backtick instead. If you go to Unicode input, you can um, you can have it activate a keyboard when you start, which obviously you'd pick APL, and then you can turn on um, maybe we have to press this to check. Oh, that's weird. Hang on. Um, well, this is working before I was able to turn on back tick, but for some reason it's not working. Never mind. No, well, you should be able to click configure layout and turn on a back tick instead. But the um, using control works fine for me. Now in um, Mac and Windows, the 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 back tick or control keys will just automatically work when you go into the app. If I run something else. Um, Jeremy, can you search screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, share screen. OK. Um, thanks for reminding me, Serata. OK, so that's the control whatevers. Um, and then um, if I go into some other dialog box or some other program, then the control buttons don't work anymore. They just get my normal like control A selects all. Um, if you want in Windows, if you want to use the dialog keyboard elsewhere, you can hold down the Windows button and press space and it'll pop up a list and keep holding down Windows. It'll pop up a list of different keyboards and you can just choose Dialog APL keyboard. And so now if I start typing control, it, I get the, the dialog ones here. So if you're trying to use like, if you're trying to select something and then try to copy it with like control C and it doesn't work, that might be because you actually have the dialog keyboard running. So then you'll just have to hold down windows and press space to go back to a non APL keyboard. Um, for Mac, um, just go to this um, APL fonts and keyboards dialog page and click on Mac OS and it'll show you um, how to enable the keyboard and then um, you can change your keyboard layout um, for Mac. But you don't have to use the, any of this just to use Ride or the Windows IDE. This is just if you want to use them outside. So has anybody had any issues with installing? Oh, the other thing to mention is on Linux, if you go to the forum, um, there is a link here using dialogue in Debian, uh, which describes how to install it. Because you do have to install at least one extra thing and possibly two and shows how to use the keyboard. Um, and then I see um, Adam who actually works at dialogue has kindly added a note here about ride, which we've already mentioned. So that's good. And so that includes the backtick thingies. All right. Yeah, did anybody have any issues with installing or any other um, notes? Um, oh, I see Wasim has mentioned try APL. Okay, yeah. So I haven't really used this myself, but I know a lot of people talk about it, which is, yeah, APL in your browser. Um, does this do backtick? 
Yes, it does. So it looks like backtick works here. Cool. So you can use backtick followed by a letter to put it in there. And they've also got the What's this tab? Seven equals tab. Seven, seven tab. S. Oh, I see. There's multiple ways to type this. So prefix S, I think, means backtick S. Yes. Okay. So that's how you can read those little thingies, or you can just click on them. All right. Is everybody able to run APL and type stuff? Okay. Just yell if you can't, otherwise we'll keep moving on. I guess with APL, it's not like the conciseness and expressiveness of it means that it's not like you're typing at 100 words per minute anyway, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's more like uh, typing a math equation or something, I suppose. Um, yeah. Charles says, going to an obscure programming language course at 2 a.m., what am I doing with my life? We can't help you with that, Charles, because we're also all here, some of, some, some of whom are here on Independence Day. So everybody here will not be able to empathize with any troubles you're having. Sorry. Um, all right. So, okay, we're making progress. So I'm going to run dialog. Increase the font size. And I don't know if there's a way to turn these off by default, but you can get a bit more space back by clicking on these little various X's around the place. I do feel like it would be nice to get some more space by removing the word language bar above the language bar. I'm not showing that much, not much doing much for us, but so be it. All right, so uh, show you, I, I'm not an expert in this um, IDE, but um, it kind of behaves like a normal REPL, so I can type numbers, I can type expressions. Um, so yeah, the answer from dialog APO appears on the left and my input appears indented. Um, something it took me a while to realize is that you can click on an earlier one with your mouse or, or up, go up to it and then, um, you know, edit it. And if I press enter, it actually, this one goes back to what it used to say, and then this, and it'll put my new thing on a new line, which is actually really, really helpful. So I think that's my number one uh, uh, tip that I've found so far. Uh, you can also bind uh, scrolling through history mm. uh, to a hotkey. Yes, you can. And I thought it might have even have come with one. I can't find anything that it's working for. Um, dialogue, APO, keyboard history. Mm, no. All right. Uh, how do you? All right. How do you do you that? Is it configure preferences? Uh, yeah. Okay. Called configure in my one. Probably keyboard shortcuts. Yes, and it is called backward or undo, I believe. Backward or undo, control, shift, DK. back, control, shift, backspace. Control, shift, backspace. There we go. Nice. Okay. That's great. Um, all right. So... The next thing I wanted to do was get a Jupyter kernel working. Because um, I'll tell you my, my plan, and I'll tell you why it's my plan. Um, most array programming tutorials, books I've seen, kind of like look at one concept at a time and go pretty deep on it, which is not the fast AI way, way to teach things. And I think it's particularly not the right way to teach APL. And the reason for that is that when I look up stuff in the help, so in dialogue for Windows, I can wave over one of these and go down and I can click on more. And it doesn't always come to the front, but here we go, I get the help. Now, 
let me explain how to read the help. The help tells you, it shows me up here what the glyph is. And every glyph has a name. So that small circle is called jot. And um, we'll talk about this soon in more detail, but generally speaking, each glyph does two things called monadic and dyadic. Um, and each of those things has its own name. So jot can do either beside or bind. Okay, so we can click on beside. All right, now you can see the problem here is that the examples all use glyphs that we don't know. And so it's like looking up in a dictionary to learn how to read Chinese when you don't know, know Chinese. So my plan is to first learn every single glyph, like in as simple a way as possible, so that then we can read the documentation. <laughs> um, so I think this is something that I haven't seen done before, and I'm quite enthused about learning all the glyphs. Um, so I, I, I've been teaching math to my daughter and her best friend, Claire and Gabe, and um, just the very idea I told them, we're gonna try and learn all the glyphs. And they're just very excited about the idea of like all of these weird symbols becoming things that we understand and there won't be weird symbols anymore. So for me, most of these are still weird symbols to be clear. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, like a lot of them probably won't take long to learn. Like obviously these plus <laughs> minus times divide and these equals, you know, so quite a few of them. So we'll start with the ones that we can recognize. So the, yeah, one reason I wanna get Jupyter going is I wanna be able to start writing blog posts about APL. Um, so let's try installing that together. I don't know if anybody's already done it, but I'm gonna go Jupyter APL kernel. I, um, I played around with uh, APL a little bit a couple of yeah. years ago before uh -huh. I took a break. And I found that getting the Jupyter kernel for APL working just kind of works. So Good. hopefully let's, that's still the case, but let's do it, it was really easy to get it going. All right. Uh, so I've already got Jupyter installed um, on Windows. You can use Conda or PIP to install it. Probably Conda might be a better option. Um, and so now, Let's see if this is the right button. Install dialog, I've done that. Install Anaconda, I've done that. Oh, that's right. They haven't actually got a pip or conda installer for this, which obviously they ought to fix or we should fix for them. Download this. Fine. Save. Okay. And Just recently, I found my downloads in Chrome have started taking a ridiculously long time, but looks like it's finally done. Okay, so let's unzip that. Okay, and then it's said to run install.bat. Run anyway. Okay, looks like something happened. Uh, okay, let's see if what we wanted to happen happened. So I run Jupyter. Okay, and new, oh, dialog. Go baby, go. So now I'm gonna use Windows uh, allow it to communicate, that's fine. Okay, so I'm probably gonna to have to hit Windows space to choose the dialog keyboard. And okay, cool. So one, one plus one. All right, you're right, Isaac, that was pretty easy. So um, if 
uh, somebody on Mac, do you have a, is there a like integrated help in Ride that gives you access to something like this? No, it opens up web, a uh, website basically. Okay, well, that's fine. I was gonna say everything that's in there is also in the website. Let's try searching for that exact thing. And of course, I just tried to hit Control T to open up a tab, but that doesn't work because I'm in the Dialog APO keyboard. Um, dialog language elements. Here we go. Okay. Open with navigation. I guess I don't really need the navigation. All right. So I feel like they're, at least these are not in a bad order to learn about them. So let's start with plus. And let's start by learning to read these things. Okay, so up in the top right here, we've got the glyph. And generally speaking, for functions, they're gonna show us uh, the two things that they can do. They're called monadic and dyadic. Um, actually, let's start with minus because it's a little easier. Um, monadic and dyadic. Monadic means that you're going to put something only on the right hand side. Like, for example, neg negate three. That is the monadic form. If you've heard the word monad before in stuff like Haskell, this is not that. This simply means a function that takes one argument. And in APL, you don't write functions like that. Instead, you write your argument after, if you have one argument. And if there are two arguments, you can have a second argument before. So it looks more like math than normal computing. So monadic means one argument. Um, you'll see here that the negate function, when applied to three, returns like upper hyphen three. This upper hyphen is control two. I'm gonna say control, but for, for Mac users, that means backtick, control two. And this is how you write a minus sign in APL, meaning the constant number negative two. So these are two different things, right? This is a function that negates its argument. This is part of a numeric literal constant, which is the negative number. Now it so happens that the negated function, negate function applied to three and the number negative three are the same thing, but they're different, conceptually different. This is, this is a single number. This is a function. Um, okay, so monadic. Monadic means it takes one argument and the argument goes on the right. Does that make sense so far? Please tell me if it doesn't. Otherwise, we're gonna keep looking at the help because I wanna show you how I look at the help. Basically, the help focuses on examples. And the idea is that you can kind of figure things out by looking at the examples. So if you copy the indented bit of the example and paste it, you should get the same result. Now, this looks pretty similar to the example we just gave, but you'll see that they've got multiple numbers, multiple numbers on the right. They've got 3.2, negative seven, and zero. Um, this is how you create um, a one-dimensional array, or in kind of PyTorch speak, a rank one tensor, or in math speak, a vector. Um, you just chuck spaces between them, between numbers. So there's some controversy about whether this is accurate, but I'm just gonna use the word array for everything. So this is, I'm gonna call this, for example, the number three, which we call a scalar. I'm gonna call a, a rank zero array. Here's a rank one array. 
Um, so when I say array, I'm going to include scalars, okay? So in the minus 3.2, negate 7, 0. Yeah. Yes. What is this? It, it's Okay, so that is a list, or this is an array huh? containing the numbers 3.2, negative 7, and 0. And this is the function that you're applying to it. The function. And okay. so this is the result. Ah, got it. Okay, so the result is it's like NumPy. It's applying the function to every element of the array. So the negative function, negate function applied to 3.2 is negative 3.2, applied to negative 7 is 7, and applied to 0 is 0. So it is a neg negative function, it's not the minus. Correct. Well. This, is, this is the minus that's part of a, of a literal number. This is the negate function. All right, but, but it's, uh, when you were typing this, did you do control two or did you do minus? Did no, this is minus, that? this is minus. This so is minus. minus on the keyboard is the dash. Yes. The control two is for the special negative number symbol. Jeremy, I posted yeah. a command in the uh, chat, which will turn boxes on, and it'll draw boxes around your list, so you can see kind of the structure of what you put in there. All right, let's do it. Copy. Do you know a way to do this automatically, by the way, when you start APO? Because it feels like I, what I always want. I, I do not. There we go. OK, now, I can't quite remember how to read these weird arrow things, but I guess we'll figure it out as we go. But this is basically saying this is, I think this arrow is saying that there is a, a dimension here. So this is a one-dimensional array. And I don't know what the squiggle means. Jeremy, I tried yeah. this boxing. Um, so we, you go to the session, next to session, there's a one and two. They have a boxes there. No, not this one. Under the, yeah. This one is also turned on the box. Okay. And does that do the max thingy or? Oh, uh, what that mean? Uh, there's a style equals max. So like, I don't know. Uh, you can set style to men and it will draw fewer things. Okay. So if you just are dealing with larger arrays. Okay. Max so I don't know if this one is the min or the max, but that's really useful, Serata. Thank you. Well spotted. Yeah, they're just a, a box uh, for everything. Hmm. Yeah. So about the squiggle, I, I think there is a difference between a list hmm. and a two dimensional array that's three columns in one row. Yes, absolutely. Um, when you say a list, I think you mean a rank one array or a vector. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, we'll come back to that. So if you do nested lists, you can kind of see what the boxes are, are really about. Yeah. Well, 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 let's leave that for now. Um, great. So I think we've got enough now to understand the first piece of documentation. So that's good. Um, so let's, um, pop this in a separate window. Um, all right. So, um, type, um, numbers. And so we should show that one. Um, and then we've got rank one arrays. Okay. And then we've got um, monadic minus. And I guess we could link that to the documentation. 
Okay, so now if I click on the gate, we're going to get more information about monadic minus, right? And so notice that hyphen in APL is pronounced minus sign or bar. I'm not used to seeing things with two names. They normally just have one. Um, and it can mean two things. And the monadic version is called negate. So when people talk about like read out APL expressions, they will often refer to the names of them. So they'll say negate. Um, now, this one's interesting. Copy. Um, let's pop it actually in here. Paste. Now notice here, this does not mean minus four, two, zero. This means minus of that. I know there's no space after the minus, but space doesn't have meaning after a function. So that's why two is being negated and negative three is being negated because the minus refers to the whole thing. Uh, it would be more obvious if there was a space here. Now, if we had written negative four, that would be something else entirely. That would be the number negative four, then the number two, then the number zero. But minus is a function and it applies to its whole right-hand side. And its whole right-hand side is a rank one array. And that's why we get two goes to negative two, negative three goes to three and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay, so Isaac's just added in the chat something useful, which is that there is also a bookmark that you can drag to your bookmarks bar, which I've actually already done. And somebody, by the way, maybe as we do these things, could add these to the forum thread, uh, to the forum wiki. Uh, so if I click APL here, if you... Yeah. Um, yeah, so now we've got all these things. Oh, now is back to gonna work. Let's try that. Nice. Okay, this is better. I'm gonna turn off my keyboard. Okay, I'm glad we've tried that. So now back tick works. And this is written in JavaScript, so this will be cross-platform. <laughs> All right, so maybe we should show these examples. Two. Okay, minus applied to four, minus applied to negative four. Um, the kind of the the APL way and the, AP, the AERA programming way of like showing things in general, which I quite like, does involve um, a lot of examples, um, which does like require the reader to like look at the example and figure out what's going on. And this is what I've been doing in teaching the kids some math and APL. Um, is we look at the examples, we paste them into dialogue, and then we say like, oh, who can guess what's happening here? Um, and it's actually quite a good, it's quite a good exercise, but it requires a little more work perhaps than people are used to. Okay, we got decimals, rank one arrays, one attic minus. Um, so maybe that should be a heading three, and then we'll create a heading two, which is this is minus, oopsie daisy. Oh, back ticks. How do I do a real back tick? Crap. Uh, anybody know how to type a back tick? You could temporarily close the JavaScript bar, I guess. I <laughs> could. Yeah. Uh, 
I could always ask Adam if he knows. I was hoping the back tick, back tick would give us what we needed. Is there a back tick in here? I don't think so. Do you have a, a numpad? Is it alt? I do not. Six or one, two, six. I do not. Do you know that off the top of your head? That's a bit crazy. No, I Googled it. Alt <laughs> back tick seems to work. Huh? Alt back tick. Alt back tick. Nope. Nope. Oh, what just happened? Whoa, that's a weird thing. I, somehow I just pressed a button that put up a terminal. I was what? able to do option back tick on, on Mac. Hold option and back tick on Mac. Yeah. And that gave me a back tick with an underline. And if I hit enter, it turned into a regular back tick. Uh. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll let them later. <laughs> okay, so this was called minus sign or bar. And this was called negate. Okay, so now I can do dyadic. So dyadic means it has two arguments. This is called minus or subtract. Okay, so normally, Two arguments in a function looks like this, unless you do what we call infix notation, in which case it looks like this. Um, APL is always infix notation. So to dyadic means it has two arguments. One argument goes on the left, one argument goes on the right. Okay. Any questions about dyadic versus monadic? Um, so just like in NumPy, um, you've probably noticed that you can apply a function to an array, and the function is applied to each element of the array. Negative goes to four, negative of two, negative of zero, negative of minus three, negative of minus five. So we can do the same thing when it's got two arguments. We can have one on the right and then a different argument on the left. Does that make sense? So that's uh, element wise, just like NumPy, three minus four, two minus five, one minus one. Um, This also works, is you can have uh, a rank one array minus a scalar. And just like NumPy, it'll broadcast this. So this is three minus one, two minus one, and one minus one. And vice versa. One minus three, one minus two, one minus one. Is there um, much of a yeah. culture of using brackets in this world? To I wouldn't say there's a culture of using parentheses, but I would say there are times you have to use parentheses. Um, I would say, I can't imagine anybody would use parentheses around this. Just like in Python, if you were writing, whoopsie daisy, if you were writing 1.5 times 6.2, we know perfectly well that dot binds tighter than times. So in Python, nobody would write this. 
right? Whereas somebody who didn't know that dot binds pilot binds tighter than asterisks would say like, well, this is much clearer, but like, eh, you know, only the first three times after that, you know perfectly well that this means 1.5 times 6.2 rather than 1.5 times 6.2. Um, so arrays are everywhere in APL. So the idea of parenthesizing this in such an expression would be weird. And I've never seen that done. Okay. Um, and I guess in general, because the kind of parsing and precedence rules in APL, as you'll discover, are so simple and clear, um, parentheses generally only seem to be used in real code when they're actually necessary rather than just for clarity. Um, I would say in something like C++, we see parentheses used for clarity a lot more because for example, in C++ or even in Python, the precedence rules are very complicated and few people remember them and they're easy to misremember. Uh, all right, so I feel like we've probably done our first glyph. So that's cool. Um, so our second glyph we can do will be plus. Um, and dyadic plus is the easy one. So maybe I'll just do some copying and pasting. In fact, that's a good way to get a back tick as I'll put it in my paste buffer. Haha. <laughs> All right. So this one is called conjugate, and then the other one will be called plus. Uh, and the overall thing is called plus sign. That's easy, plus sign. And monadic is called conjugate, conjugate. And this is called, oh, got it the wrong way. Oh, no, that's fine. I just have to write dyadic, dyadic. Maybe I'll make a copy of this underneath the next time. Okay. Um, so we can basically do the same thing as last time. Paste those here. And we will replace dash with plus. And three plus two is five. Uh, rank one array plus rank one array. Rank one array plus a scalar, which is a rank zero array kind of, they all work. So hopefully that one is straightforward. Um, now, conjugate. So it's pretty normal in APL to provide, to provide a rank one array to an example, because that way you kind of get to three, show three examples in one go, right? So it's important to just look at them one at a time. Um, but maybe, you know, to start with, we can like do that. But like, we shouldn't need to do this for too long because hopefully we'll get the idea that to read this, it means plus 1.2 plus 0j4 plus minus 5j minus 6, which means I think we need to talk about complex numbers. <laughs> which is cool because we get to talk about some math. All right, so is anybody on the call, and please don't be shy of saying yes, because we're trying to learn math. Is anybody on the call don't know at all what a complex number is? Yep. Me. Yep, okay, great. So um, have you ever come across the idea that um, 
the square root of minus one is something called i. No, I know that i is a thing, but okay. Made the connection. That is what i is. So basically, the idea is that um, we can um, we can square things, which means multiply by itself. Um, So three times three equals nine. And so what do we have to square? That means three squared equals nine. Um, we'll get ahead of ourselves a little bit. And uh, no, this is, this, let's not, let's just do that. Um, so to write squared, we can also say to the power of two, um, be very careful. This means power of in APL, not times. So there's three squared. Okay, and there's four squared. And so we can do the opposite and say, what would you have to square to make 16? And the answer could be either four, because four times four is 16, or it could also be negative four, because negative four, negative four squared is also 16. You happy so far? Okay. So then the question is, okay, okay, so the question of like, what do you have to square to get to this number is the square root. So the square root of 16, and we always take the positive, the square root of 16 is 4. So then the question is, well, what's the square root of minus 1? And the answer is, oh, it's the number that you would have to multiply by itself to get minus 1, which of course doesn't exist as a real number, because minus 1 times minus 1 is positive 1. So um, we just make it up. We make up a number and we say, okay, I'm going to invent a number. I'm going to call it i. And i is the number that if you square it, you get negative one. And I can't show you i pineapples, but I also can't show you negative three pineapples. You know, they're both like invented ideas. I mean, I can't even show you the number two. I can show you the digit two, I can show you two things, but the idea of the number two is a mathematical concept. Um, so numbers don't necessarily exist. Um, uh, and so a lot of mathematicians say I is considered is called an imaginary number, but it's not any more imaginary than any other number because all numbers are imaginary. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... A, a, you can then create something called a complex number, which is an imaginary number plus a real number added together. A real number being anything that's not doesn't have i in. So, for example, here's a real number. Okay, and here's an imaginary number. And so that means that this here is a complex number. And there's no way to like reduce that further. We're done. Okay, that's that is the number three plus i. Um, you can do things with i. You can multiply it by four, and then four, four times i is four i. That's a number. You can square it, and of course you'd get minus one. This i minus one my i squared is minus one. Um, you can multiply i by four and then add three, and that gives you the number three plus four i. So here is the real part, and here is the imaginary part. And the whole thing is called a complex number. And you can't like, this is not an equation. I can't do anything to this. This is the number. It's called, the number is three plus four i. In um, APL, we can write complex numbers in a slightly more concise way. And we write them using a j. On the left-hand side is the real part. On the right-hand side is the imaginary part. So this is zero plus four i, also known as four i. This is negative five plus minus six i, also known as negative five minus six i. Does that make sense? So complex numbers always involve i. There aren't any other mm -hmm. yep. letters. There aren't, there aren't, there's no need for any more. We just need the one extra letter, which is this ability to kind of say like, oh, there's a second bunch of things in the world. And the key reason that 
complex numbers are really interesting and important is because you take the number line that we all learned, like my daughter learned the number line in prep, right? You can move forward along the number line to get bigger numbers and backward to get smaller numbers. And after you go forward, you can then like undo that with negative to go back to where you started. When you use a complex, um, complex numbers, you move from a number line to a number plane. And the y-axis represents how many eyes do you have? And the x-axis represents what the real number is. Um, and so then you can graph it on a Cartesian plane. Like so. So you've got the numbers. Jeremy, I think you're not sharing the screen. Okay. I never share my screen. That's just much, that's just how I am until your Serata tell me to. Okay. So yeah, so you've got the numbers on this axis and the negative ones on this axis. Um, yeah, here we go. So here's our number line. Here's our num number plane. And so here's three plus four i. And so um, in um, real number only math, you can multiply by a negative number and it flips it to the other side. But in, um, in complex math, you can multiply by i and it rotates it by 90 degrees. Uh, I gotta get the door just a moment. Realized my wife had got home. Okay. So, um, yeah, they you know they're used for a lot of things, which um, um, kind of expand the world of math to two dimensions, you know, and um, and they give us you know they let us work with with tuples of two things at a time. Um, so they, yeah, they come up a lot in, in, in real life. And in fact, you know, in, in physics, it turns out that our actual real physical world um, operates according to the laws of complex numbers, not real numbers. Um, so they're very real. Um, okay. It sort so, of feels yeah. like, oh, so, sorry. No, if I'm no, 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 don't, please, like please I'd like to chat. So interrupt anytime, go ahead. Sure. Uh, it kind of feels like a complex number. It's like a shorthand for representing like a 2D or a two a rank two mm. array as not just a rank two array, a rank numbers. one array of two items. Yeah. Rank, yes. Yeah, because like because you're like using the uh, the plane and the um, the unit circle and stuff. It feels yeah. like you're trying to represent like that second element in that array mm. is written in terms of its relation to the first element or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh. it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I think like getting an intuition for complex numbers is is very interesting. And maybe we'll add like a, we should add a forum thread about complex numbers and put some videos there. Cause there's a lot of nice videos about kind of the intuition around this. Um, so I just wanted to come to a question that Charles asked in the chat, which I think is an interesting and good one, which is, um, can you explain what your motivations are for investing your time in this? What kind of real world applications are there? Uh, where this being um, array programming and APL, I guess. Um, so um, there's a number uh, of, of reasons not all of which are related to the second part of Charles's question, which is what are the real world applications of this? Um, there certainly are some, at least indirectly. Um, but I'd also say, yeah, it's not my only reason for being interested is not just real world applications. But I think first and foremost for me, um, math is quite beautiful. You know, I, I think it's like, a field that can contain a lot of beauty in a very deep aesthetic way. Um, 
but I'd also say it's an area that frustrates me. You know, math is, frustrates me because um, I find it very kind of inconsistent. Uh, you know, like the way and the, like the notation is often very hard to look up, and it's also like hard for me to understand what things mean in a very abstract way when I can't like experiment with them. So like one thing for me is it, is it helps me understand math. Um, it also helps me teach math. So I'm, I'm teaching my daughter math and there are things which I was finding difficult to teach her um, until I started teaching her with APL um, and NumPy. Um, in particular, like sequences and series was the first one where I just had no luck teaching her and her friend Gabe sequences and series. I did a whole hour on it. Then we made no progress at all. And then when we did it, you know, via learning first some NumPy and some APL and then coming back a week later, and, and then it was easy to explain. Um, so, yeah, so one is, you know, I think um, uh, a way into math, one is a way into teaching math. Another is, um, I think there's such beauty and power in notation. Um, in our last study group, we talked about the power of the notation that is regular expressions, for example. Now, APO, APL is a much deeper notation than regular expressions, but like notation, a powerful notation is a key thing used to further human intellectual development. You know, and you'll see this repeatedly, particularly in mathematics, um, but also in other areas like physics. Uh, things that like just take, you know, hundreds of years for very smart people to advance, then somebody finds a notation for that thing and it, it powers ahead. Um, so things like algebra, for example, dramatically, you know, impacted our ability to, to develop math. Um, uh, the notation of numerals, which includes the digit zero, also dramatically improved our ability as a, as a species to develop mathematics. Um, but, you know, other areas like juggling, you know, ju you know, there was a development of a notation for juggling a few years ago, and suddenly there was huge developments in what people were doing because they were able to manipulate the notation and say, like, oh, what if we move this over here? Or, you know, you, you start to create ways to manipulate the symbols in the notation to develop new ideas. So, you know, APL is a very powerful notation, not just for math, but for a range of things that can be represented using the similar kind of concepts that we use in math. For example, one guy has built a GPU compiler using APL, and they did their PhD essentially in like APL as a notation for building compilers. Um, so that would be another one. At a more pragmatic level, um, so I learned a little bit of J before I did any APL, um, but J is much the same thing. Yeah, I definitely felt like it, learning J did more for my programming skills than any other language I've learned because um, APL as notation was developed in the late 1950s. And so it's been continually developed in the, in the decades since. Um, in really quite a kind of independent branch to all the other computer languages. So APL, J, K, the array languages have this their own little world. And so if you've not worked with languages from that branch, you miss out on that entire development of thinking. Um, now I will say nowadays, NumPy and derivatives of that have borrowed a lot of ideas from APL, um, but in a very kind of impure way. Uh, <coughs> so I would say also like for somebody doing deep learning and that kind of programming, you know, scientific programming in, in Python. Um, yeah, I think you're, you know, you'll, you'll discover better ways of thinking about these kind of loopless programming. <laughs> particularly if you then look at things like Einstein notation or INOPS or stuff like that. Did anybody else have any other kind of reasons they were interested in this or um, 
questions about that or anything else? Yeah, I guess for me, it's just um, a different way of thinking. I mean, I'm, ho I'm hoping mm. that um, as we, um, I mean, it's always, it's always the case you get a, a big speed up if you can remove a loop and, and vectorize things and um, you don't really have a choice but to do that in APL for the most part. Yeah. So uh, kind of get, get a lot better at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think also like it's an interesting path into other areas of math, um, particularly J. Um, J comes with various labs. Um, um, which you can run on J. So J is like an APL derivative written by the original author of APL. Um, and yeah, it comes with all these labs, which, you know, are really interestingly kind of thoughtfully put together and basically take you through um, you know, some pretty interesting mind bending ideas from mathematics. Um, so maybe at some point we'll, yeah, morph over to Jay and try out some labs. All right. Um, so um, to wrap up today's thing, let's try to finish plus. So um, yeah, so dyadic plus. Move it up twice there. Um, we've You're already not done. Not sharing your screen. Not sharing my screen, of course. I'm not sharing my screen because I never remember. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so monadic plus is conjugate. So let's learn about that. Um, so when I click on the um, specific monadic or dyadic version, right, I'll get, so for example, here, conjugate. It'll show me how it's used. And basically it shows that we start with a number Y, we apply plus to it, and the return value of it is something called R, R for result or return value. And then in the description, it's going to tell me what each of these things are. So it says here, if Y is complex, then R, the result is Y with the imaginary part of all elements negated. If it's real or non-numeric, it's unchanged. So we should be able to view that here. So here, this is real. So the return value should be unchanged. It is. Okay, this is imaginary. This is complex. The imaginary part is four. So here is the imaginary part negated. Okay, and here is another complex number. And this is the imaginary part and here that is negated. So if you think about it on the number plane, conjugate flips just like negative does, but negative flips on the real plane, conjugate flips on the imaginary, sorry, negative flips on the real line, uh, conjugate flips on the imaginary line. Um, great, well, I think we're done here. Um, does anybody have any questions, issues, anything else? Anything you want to make sure we cover next time? Appreciate you guys joining. Um, this is going to be fun. What do we got? 21 participants. Right. That's good. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think this is going to be um, going to be a lot of fun as we keep going. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, like we actually got through more than I expected, to be honest. And I do think um, we might be able to zip through the glyphs pretty quickly on the whole. Um,
I'm going to assume that people like generally have some reasonable Python background, um, by the way. And so sometimes we'll be relying on analogies um, to Python. Um, and that should make things a bit faster as well. All right, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'll pop the videos up on YouTube. I will create a playlist for them. Um, and uh, let's use the forum, yeah, for like, add anything you like, you know, feel free to create new topics about stuff related to array programming that aren't necessarily directly related to anything we've talked about, whatever. Um, this is all very informal. All right. Bye, all. Thanks. All righty. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Bye.